got to be born again. Come on. Your name has to be written in heaven. Registered in heaven. And that's the universal church. You say, well, how important is the church? It's incredibly important to our culture and our society and in every society. Amen. Did you know where, where the church flourishes? People flourish. Economies flourish. Blessings come. Blessings happen. Amen. You know, they actually, in Bible college, we studied this uh, concept that they called redemption and lift. Because you see, if a family is living in a, in a kind of a poor area and they're struggling along to make it, and, and perhaps there's a vice or two in the family, and, and but, but you know what happens? Mom and dad get saved. They start living for God. They start believing the Lord. God begins to bless them. And you know what happens to their children oftentimes? Their children wind up getting a better education. Why? Because mom and dad aren't spending their money on things that they ought not but they're putting it into the family and you know what happens they begin to lift they begin to rise in society and they track this in culture after culture after culture i'm just here to tell you that it pays to be a part of the church of the lord jesus christ come on amen we are an important part of society you are the salt of the earth right you're a preserving factor you are the light of the world a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. In a, you're a preserving agent. We uphold the moral fiber of our community. Come on. We have to stand for something. Come on, somebody. When, society, when the church is weak, society is weak. Morality is weak. The family is weak. But when the church of Jesus Christ is strong, communities are strong. Society is strong. Family is strong. Come on, somebody. Morality is strong. And you couldn't hardly even write down. In fact, the scripture says if you were to, to write down everything that Jesus and his church does, uh, you, there wouldn't be enough books to fulfill, the, to even be able to write it. The world could not contain it. Come on. How many meals have been given in the name of Jesus? How many glasses of water have been given in the name of Jesus? How many hospitals have been opened in the name of Jesus? How many orphans have been taken care of in the name of Jesus? Amen. How many lives have been changed through Jesus' power and Jesus' strength and marriages? Come on, somebody. I'm proud to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're going to get to the best part. I saved the best for last. Amen. This is the cherry pie a la mode to this sermon. Amen. This is the lemon meringue. Man, you can tell I'm getting hungry already. I don't know why I always mention some food in the sermon. I don't know. It says this. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm telling you that the church is a powerful force in the world. And so as we conclude this message, I want to ask the question, what is meant by the gates of hell? That is a very good question. And so I did some research on it, right? And so what I found out that the term of gates and the thinking about gates was a very familiar figure of speech in those days. Gates were incredibly important to cities and communities and countries in those days. In fact, the strength of your gates determined the strength of your city. Am I right? Generally speaking, cities were surrounded by large walls and, uh, you know, in order to protect them. And so if you were going to attack a city, the weakest point would be the gates, right? Uh, and, and come on, we've all watched enough movies. You can picture it. You know, they've got the big ramrod. They're trying to knock the gate down. And, you know, you, you, you've seen that on TV enough, right? And so that's a powerful metaphor uh, for us to look at. And you see the predominant thinking behind this phrase, the gates of hell or the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, is not that the gates are attacking us, but, how, but the, we're attacking the gates. I've never heard anybody come to church and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I was just walking down the street and the neighbor's gate just came right out and just attacked me. It beat me down. I'm being silly, right? 
The gates of hell won't prevail. You want to know why? Because we have a mission. We're to be on the offensive. Amen? Come on. The Word says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To do what? To the pulling down of strongholds. We're supposed to be pulling stuff down. Amen? We're supposed to be knocking down the enemy's territory. I like the way Reinhard Bunke says it all, right? He says we are to plunder hell to populate heaven. Amen. The church is not supposed to be sitting inside our four walls wondering, oh, what's the devil going to do next? Uh, I'm just so afraid we're going to get attacked again by the devil. No, sir, that's not the attitude we're to have. Come on. Our mission is to go. Our mission is to be bold. Our mission is to proclaim our mission is to pray. Our mission is to heal the sick, cast out the devils, cleanse the leper, and preach the gospel. And some will believe and be saved, and some won't. But I'm going to tell you something. We are to be used the authority that the Lord has given us. Amen. We're to attack the gate. Oh, come on. Luke 10, 19 says this. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, don't go bringing a snake up in here. We are not a snake handling church. Unless that snake is the devil. Then we're going to stomp on him. You want to know why? Because it says the God of peace, the God of peace, shall bruise his head under your feet shortly. Come on, somebody! I'm just here today to tell you that we've got to advance the gospel. And after Jesus said, "And the gates of hell will not prevail," this is what he said in the very next verse. He said, "And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." Come on! I'm just here today to tell you that God is looking to raise up a church that's willing to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent have to take it by force. Amen. So that's the primary meaning of the gates of hell will not prevail. That's the first primary meaning of that metaphor, all right? Okay, but there's a secondary meaning to this metaphor. Let me give it to you. And it's interesting that in that culture of that day when Jesus said this, the elders as, sat in the city gates, right? If there was going to be a battle, the strategy of the battle was made from the gates because that's where people would gather and that's where they would strategize from. Armies were sent to battle from the gates. So the secondary meaning of this me metaphor is that the gates is actually, you could say that at times, yes, the enemy may gather at his gates and plot and plan and devise weapons and try to come against the church of Jesus Christ. Because how many of you know Ephesians says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly place. And yes, it's true, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. But I'm going to tell you something. I've got news for every devil of hell that Satan sends against the church of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, amen, because it says that the gates of hell, and that means even if they do send out something from those gates, guess what? It's still not going to prevail. Amen. It's not going to prevail. So here's the point. If we're on the offensive, we win. If we're on the defensive, guess what? We win as well. Hallelujah. Are you sure about that defensive part? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because the scripture says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to raise up a standard against them. It says when your shield of faith is filled with the fiery darts of the enemy, let me tell you something, guess what? You're going to still be standing. Hello, hello, amen. Now I like this one. In the book of Isaiah it says this, no weapon formed against us will prosper. 
That's the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Come on. Is there anybody in this house that says, I'm a servant of the Lord. I serve Jesus. He's my number one master. I get up in the morning and I say, Lord, what are we going to do today? I'm going to work, but you know something? My first and primary service is to you. You're my king. You're my Lord. And I'm proud to serve you. Amen. The heritage of that is this, that the enemy, yes, he may form a weapon against you that he may devise plans he may devise strategies but guess what it's not going to prosper in other words it's not going to work in the end guess what you're going to still be standing in the end you're going to win you're going to prevail you want to know why it's because you are part of the church of the lord jesus christ come on somebody give him praise today we are the church of jesus christ amen Ooh, I want to start all over and re-preach that. That was just way too fun. Hey, I believe it. Do you believe the promises of God?